And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker. Louis Sahoyas is a native of Dubuque, and I'm honored to introduce him within the larger context of the work we do every day. Louis is widely regarded as one of the world's most prominent still photographers. He has circled the globe dozens of times for National Geographic and has shot hundreds of covers for other magazines, including Fortune Magazine, Smithsonian, Discover, GEO, Time, Newsweek, The New York Times Magazine, New York Magazine, and Sports Illustrated. Louis' first documentary film, The Cove, has won more than 100 awards globally from festivals and critics became the first documentary in history to sweep all the film guilds and won the Oscar for Best Documentary Feature in 2009. <laughs> in his newest film, Race in Extinction, a team of artists and activists exposed the hidden world of extinction with never-before-seen images that change the way we see the planet. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Louis Sahoyas. We've got a, a Rubik's uh, cube of a presentation here, so something, something could go wrong. It would be very exciting. Uh, uh, Sylvester Stallone up on the on the the screen there. It was uh, 40 years ago that a film called Fist was filmed here in town, and Stallone was the star. It was like, like right after he did Rocky. It was, a, it was a, a big thing for the town. And Back then I was working as an intern for the Dubuque Telegraph Herald covering the making of the movie in town. And then Norman Jewison, the director, uh, he liked using real people in the movie, so he, uh, he asked me to be a wedding photographer for the film. I'd really never shot a wedding at that point, but... Um, so everyone in town had a, a very important role in the movie, but um, I had a very crucial speaking part. Uh, I had, my, my speaking line was, smile. <laughs> that was my line, just smile. It was, it was actually twice as long originally. I said, smile now, but they cut it back. <laughs> uh, actually, my, when I say that, my back's turned to the, to the camera, so you really can't tell it's me saying it. But, um, uh, I, I worked as an intern for the paper here at the TH for a few years, and you know, interns are a, a term used by employers to get around IRS, IRS rules for banning young people as slaves. Uh, employers figure out what it will cost to keep a photographer alive, and then they just sort of cut it back just a little bit, keep you hungry, um, keeps you creative. But uh, right back then, that, that was back in the, the, the mid-70s, we had one of the better photographic staffs in the country winning all sorts of national awards. The truth is, I love taking pictures, and I probably would have, if I had any money, I would have uh, paid them to work there. Um, I would even do s assignments that were the, the most dreaded assignments in the, you know, on the staff. I did uh, the pet of the week, and that's uh, was where you go to the Humane Society and photograph an animal that was about to be euthanized, put to death. Everybody hated that assignment, but I loved it because it was a chance to actually save an animal, and all my animals got saved. Um, you know, it did a, these kind of pictures don't save the world, but they save that dog's world. And I had a sense that, you know, you, it, it, images had power. You could actually change things. Back when I was a, a kid, you had either wanted to be a photographer for National Geographic or an astronaut. And there was, you had a better chance of becoming an astronaut because Geographic had an, hired a new photographer in over 10 years. Uh, now, I wasn't really a, a very good candidate for a geographic photographer. Uh, up until I was about 16 years old, I never saw more than three states. The other two states, you can go out here and see out the balcony. <laughs> um, but back then, geographic was doing stories like on gold, silver, platinum, diamonds. You know, what kind of stories did I want to do? Garbage. Uh, my, my career literally got started in the dumps of geographic back in 1980. There's only one mandatory recycling program, mandatory recycling program in the entire country. And I thought the, the original title I, for that story I proposed was called Urban Ore. But other places in the world, like the Philippines, 
this dump in the Philippines, the soldiers were guard, guarding the garbage from this dump because it was so valuable. Um, if you stole trash from there, you could get shot. So in 1981, I proposed a story for National Geographic. I was working there as an intern, and I got my dream job. Uh, this is a picture of an artist that, photog that uses found objects to make art. It's garbage. Back, back then, Geographic had one of the biggest circulations of any magazine in the world. Um, I think Reader's Digest was, was higher, but this was like the, the real notable one. The one that you wanted to work for as a photographer was Geographic. 11 million people got the magazine every issue. So every month, 11 million people got it, but uh, there was a pass-around rate of four. So you see, it was estimated that four people saw it for every magazine, magazine that was out there. So doctor's offices and, you know, the yeah, family has one copy, but there's four people in the family. So 44 million people saw that magazine every month, about 20% of the country. And shortly after that, recycling began to take off. It was a, a numbers game. This is a composting plant in Holland. They don't have the space for landfills in Europe like we do here. So they make it a resource. They make it that urban ore. And I did a lot of work with paleontologists and archaeologists when I worked at Geographic. And the most exciting thing they can find is a garbage dump. And you think, what's, what's going to be left of our culture? You know, our buildings are made to last a you know, couple decades. You know, after 30, 40 years, we're ready to, to retool them. But, uh, so I did this picture in Egypt, obviously, was to thinking about what are, what's going to be left of our civilization, but our, but our garbage. Um, one of the great things about working for Geographic was getting to meet some of the people that were changing the world. Back in 1993, Geographic asked me to do a story on the information revolution. This is in Photoshop. I photographed uh, Bill Gates sitting on top of a stack of paper to illustrate how much information you could put on a CD at that time. And it was 330,000 sheets of paper, single space typed. And I wanted to lay it out in a big room, but there wasn't a room big enough in America to lay it out in. And uh, we were sort of confounded by it. My assistant at the time was a bartender. And he said, uh, why don't we just stack up the paper like, like bar napkins? And so we, we, did, we drilled holes through them, put a ferrule bolt at the bottom of a steel cable with a steel plate, and had cranes uh, lowered it you know, into, into the woods behind Microsoft. And at that time, he was only the second richest guy in the world. And Geographic wanted to know what the, uh, I wanted to insure him for. <laughs> it was like $34 billion. But why was, why was that, oh, why was that Microsoft? I met their, their chief technology officer, Nathan Marivold. Uh, Bill told me it was one of the, he was one of the smartest guys that he'd ever met. Nathan was uh, set in a corner office right next to Bill's, and his job was like Bill Gates' Merlin. His job was to look into the future so that Bill and the rest of Microsoft could figure out where technology was going to be. So he, they got have products out there waiting for it. And between Nathan's office and Bill's office, they had about eight television screens all going on different channels. And I'd never seen this before. You, you, you would go to a TV store and you see eight football games, the same football game going on, but you never saw different channels on. And I asked Nathan Marable, I said, what's that for? I said, well, that's to remind Bill and I and everybody at Microsoft that comes through here that in the very near future, once fiber optic comes into the home, we'll have a 500 channel future. Now, remember, I was born in Dubuque, Iowa. We had one channel, it was channel two. When it rained, you couldn't watch TV, you had to play Monopoly or something. And I was like, channel two is like, that means there's a channel one somewhere. Where is it? Where do they keep that? I, I, like these fuzzy black and white images. I never knew if there were channel one or you know, there was other channels besides that. But, so I built this set. Um, to, to illustrate, you, you guys saw that, right? I just saw that it was moved. You, you saw it, okay. So, um, here we go. Okay, well, so Nathan, Nathan then uh, did something really interesting to me. He, 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 he drew a graph on, the, on a board, and I was, I was collecting information for the geographic story and the information revolution. And he gave me a, a, a timeline of the history of the inf of information going from the Gutenberg Bible to the present to the very near future. Now remember, this is 1993. And he said that information used to be really expensive. And it was only for nobility. You know, the people that wrote the, you know, before the Gut Gutenberg Bible, they were all hand done. It was only the monks, the nobility that could actually read these things. And so you had to be of the elite class. 
But that, he said that was going to be extremely de democratized. Back then, in 1993, you had to pay, if you were going to call Europe, you had to pay several do dollars a minute. And he said information was going to be so, so cheap that in the future, international phone calls were going to be free. He said any kid with a laptop would have the publishing potential of a, a New York Times writer, and all photographs would be digital, and everyone would be a photographer. And as he laid out this grand utopian vision of the future, I realized he was describing how my, my job, I could go extinct. <laughs> the, old, the old journalists at the time, they'd reply, they'd say, well, you know, just because you have a laptop doesn't make you a Hemingway. And just because you have a camera doesn't make you a Ansel Adams. And they were right. But so was Nathan. Uh, organizations I used to work for started to go out of business. You see what's going on with the media these days. People are, you know, they're, they're folding up, they're... They're going belly up. They're losing, uh, you know, share of, of of the news cycle to to blogs. But but there's more being published now than ever. And but to reach that big geographic size audience where you could influence a generation with a single issue, they've all but vanished. So the question I had was what, like, how big of an audience do you need to create social change? And I found this study, peer-reviewed study where scientists had discovered that the tipping point for the spread of ideas was 10%. It wasn't 7%, it wasn't 8%, it wasn't 17%, it was 10%. So I called up the, the lead scientist doing this study, and I said, what's with 10%? Why not you know, some other random number about that? He said, well, he sent me this. <laughs> and I said, I said, can you put it into layman's terms? And he said, yeah. He said, it's, uh, it's like when you're trying to create steam. You can heat up water all you want, but if you don't reach a boiling point, you'll never be able to create steam. It's the same thing with the, idea, with the spread of ideas. 10% of the population has to be 100% committed to an idea, and that becomes the boiling point for the spread of ideas. It works with the suffragette movement. It works with the civil rights movement, it worked with uh, the, the Arab Spring in, in, uh, in Tunisia. So 10% of the committed population is the boiling point for the spread of ideas. It explains why that story I did on garbage wasn't the single reason recycling began to take off. Activists, politicians, media, all helped to turn up the heat to the boiling point. And the reason the sheepdog, the sheepdog got saved wasn't just because it was a cute little picture. 75% of the people in that town got that newspaper. Of course it would get saved. It was just a numbers game. Everything, it's, just about, it's just about turning up the heat. And th these tipping points, we forget, can happen really quickly. Now, this is a, a scene from the top of a building in New York City for an Easter parade, 1905. There, this is a sea of horses. There's one electric car. There. Now, about eight years later, same street, Easter Parade, it's Find the Horse. It's right there. Ten years, ten years' time. That's what we were using ten years ago. We were hitting the number six key, the number, two, the, number the C key, six times to get a capital C. It's only been 10 years since the iPhone came out. I, when I, I photographed Steve Jobs when he was just uh, beginning to make films at a little animation studio called Pixar. It was a, during the first Toy Story. Uh, some people have that Midas touch that seem to create tipping points with everything that they do. Visionaries that create businesses that go viral all the time. Back when I was doing the information revolution story for, for Geographic, Steve Jobs wasn't really on our radar. The, the Steve Jobs of, of that gen, my generation growing up at that time was actually this guy, Jim Clark. Um, he, he couldn't be photographed. He couldn't be bothered for National Geographic when I was doing that story. Um, but I really wanted to meet him. He was a serial, entre, a serial entre, entrepreneur. Um, when he was a graduate student, he helped put a man on the moon. When J, JFK called for, to put American on the moon by the end of the decade, Jim was working as a graduate student on the night shift at Saturn, uh, up at uh, Boeing, and working on the Saturn engines, and he saw that wasn't going to happen. He sped up, remember the college kid, he sped up the computers by 20-fold to make that happen. When he taught at Stanford, he designed the first uh, 3D graphics engine, 
and created a company called Silicon Graphics um, to, that made movies like Jurassic Park and Toy Story possible. The day he quit Silicon Graphics, he started a company called Netscape. Uh, it's the first commercial internet browser, the first way that people of my age got onto the internet. Uh, the third billion dollar company that he created was called WebMD, and that's when I met him. I was photographing for the cover of, of Fortune magazine. He was building one of the largest sailing super yachts in the world back then, and he asked me if I'd teach him how to be a good photographer. And I said, Jim, I'll teach you how to be a great photographer if you teach me how to be a billionaire. <laughs> we went all over the world. He'd pick me up on his Gulfstream 5 uh, at my little local airport, and we'd fly off and take pictures at these exotic places. But the, most, the thing that we loved to do the most was to take pictures underwater. Uh, we, were, we became dive buddies for 10 years. Uh, that's Jim photographing a whale shark off the coast of the Galapagos. The most beautiful thing I've ever done is put my head underwater and see this alien universe. You know, Elon Musk wants to go to Mars, but we know that there's no life on Mars, but there's plenty of life right here. It's, you know, the, the most beautiful things I've ever seen are underwater, these little jewel boxes. We go to the most remote places in the world to, to, to find the, the best reefs in the world. And Jim would take me to these places that he'd been before, a couple years before, and say, I gotta go to, you got to go to Papua New Guinea. We you know, fly in his plane, we get in the big boats, we, we drop in on it. And more often than not, well, here, I just want to show you this, this camera he built. It was the, he built for us the best underwater camera ever made by an order of magnitude. It was just, we called it the doomsday machine because it was, it, we, wanted, we know that these, rat, these reefs aren't going to last because of what's going on with the oceans, acidification and warming. So we wanted to take the last great pictures of reefs when they're still in their pristine states. Because everywhere we would go, they would be degraded, sometimes even completely destroyed by coral bleaching and dynamite fishing. We were shooting in the Galapagos and we were watching fishermen illegally longlining in a marine sanctuary and Jim turns to me and says, somebody should do something about this. And, you know, we all have these, these demons that, that haunt us. You know, times we didn't stand up to be heard through whatever it is, fear, cowardice, ignorance. Let me tell you about an event that still haunts me. Uh, that artist you saw the, that did the cover of the National Geographic trash issue, I was going to go meet him at a flea market and where he's going to buy some found objects for art for, for National Geographic. It was a blue sky day. The artist hadn't showed up, the market was really busy. A pickup truck pulled right out in front of me. And there was a driver of the pickup truck, I could see him in the review mirror. And he had these big review mirrors that were used for, for loads, so they used to come out wide. And then on the other side, right behind me, but lined up with me, was a, was a family walking, holding hands, like a Norman Rockwell painting. A, a daughter, a boy, a, a mother and a father, and they're holding hands. And it's busy, crowded, you know, sort of noisy. And for where I was, I was thinking, he shouldn't be driving a car like that. It could be dangerous. And I could see that he wasn't slowing down for these kids. And the mirror swapped these kids, and they were still holding on to their parents' hands as they got crushed by the truck. And the scream that tried to come out of my mouth, I, I, I still to this day can't figure out why I wasn't able to speak up when I was most needed. But Jim turned to me and said, somebody should do something about this. And I realized it was my turn to speak up. I said, Jim, well, how about you and I trying to save the oceans? He said, well, what do you mean? I said, we'll use your money in my eye and we'll make films. <laughs> and I'd never made a film before in my life. Remember, I come from Iowa. It's a very, if you look outside, it's a landlocked state. But, you know, I felt sort of emboldened by all of Jim's successes that, you know, maybe together we, we could do something. Uh, so we, we did this. We had T-shirts printed up for a company called the Oceanic Preservation Society. We had a little, little humble mission, mission statement. We're not trying to save the whole planet, just 70% of it. <laughs> and I quit, a, you know, a, a really good career so I could become a, a documentary filmmaker. So I'm, I'm on... On a boat, now Jim has built another boat. It's the world's largest private sailboat. And another guest comes on the boat. Steven Spielberg. And he used, he used Jim's computers to make Jurassic Park. And I said, Mr. Spielberg, so happy to meet you. Do you have any advice for a first-time filmmaker? 
And he said, yeah, never make a movie involving boats or animals. <laughs> well, the, the first film Jim and I made was called The Cove. If you haven't seen it, it involves a lot of boats and a lot of animals. Japanese fishermen use boats to scare dolphins into a secret cove where they kill them and sell their meat for human consumption. The mayor of this fishing town was then forcing school children, because they have to eat everything on their plate, to eat the toxic dolphin meat for school lunch programs. Let me explain. Like, you know, if you have a high level of mercury in America, it's like one part per million, all the dolphin meat that's been tested in Japan had between five and 5,000 times more mercury than allowed by Japanese law. This was toxic. And they're feeding it to school children. And then the, the dolphins that they didn't kill, they would uh, use the surviving dolphins and sell them away to uh, the, like the sea worlds of the world, like the marine parks. And like Spielberg's Jaws, we had made a horror film, but in ours, it was real, and the, and the humans were the monsters. And uh, I just want to show you a trailer for that film. Okay. I do want to say that we try to do the story legally. There it is. A little town with a really big secret. It's so bizarre. What's going on over here? When we first got in the country, we had no idea who was following us. You think they know we're here? We didn't know if it was the whalers the Japanese Mafia. Somebody's behind me. I don't know who that is. They don't like me. They don't like my message. Rick is world famous for his work with dolphins. I feel somewhat responsible because it was the Flipper TV series that created this multi-billion dollar industry. The dolphin smile is nature's greatest deception. It creates the illusion they're always happy. You realize after a while they don't really belong in captivity. I'd never seen so many dolphins before. The Japanese people don't even know about it. They take the boats around to the secret cove that nobody could see. They're afraid of cameras. They said if the world finds out what goes on here, we'll be shut down. They were hiding something. We need to get in there and film exactly what happens. We need to know the truth. We needed people with a special set of skills to implement this mission. They're behind me. Let's go, let's go. Good luck. Underwater camera is set. They're not being told that the free lunch meat that their children are getting are contaminated. Let it not be said that you didn't know about it. You know about it. If we can't fix that, there's no hope. Okay, there's a flashlight. The guards are moving. The guards are moving. Get out of there. Get out of there now. Like the mayor said, it became the most winning documentary history when uh, it first swept all the guilds, won film festivals from Sundance to the the Oscar, but the most important thing is when we started that film, they were killing 23,000 dolphins and porpoises a year for human consumption, all of them toxic. And now they're killing less than 3,000. It's not for human consumption. They're, they're actually using it for animal feed. So there's an 82% drop in cetacean slaughters, dolphins and porpoises, since that movie began. Uh, you know, to me, films are a, a weapon of mass construction. With a, you know, with a bomb, guns, you kill people. You destroy things with a film, you create allies. And across all the social met networks that we have of uh, the films we've done, now we have over two million people that, uh, that help us on, on these issues. And these are not just people who like us. They're part of that committed 10% of the population that really are 100% in. And I thought, well, well the, uh, and it's, sometimes it's not just the film. It's the, the activism that's created around it. Uh, one of the people that saw uh, The Cove Judy Bart, she was an executive producer who'd never done a film before in her life either, like, like me, but she, she did a film, she financed a film about dolphins called Blackfish, and that's about orcas in, at SeaWorld. About 60 million people saw that documentary. It reached 20% of America, and that pot began to boil. The steam got uh, heated up. Now, my organization sent a, copy, uh, sent a copy of The Cove and Blackfish to every board member member who sat on the 10 top investment firms who were backing SeaWorld. 
That gesture, along with proposed legislation to ban the breeding of orcas in California, led to nearly a billion dollar market value fall of SeaWorld stock in a single day. <laughs> with, with, the, with the dolphin captivity issue, we, we reached that tipping point, and it's going that direction. Um, the National Aquarium in, in uh, Baltimore is, is just, they don't use bol- uh, dolphins anymore. They're releasing them into a marine sanctuary. That's happening all over the world. So we started this movement. But I thought, well, how could we scale up that kind of success, scale, scale it up to solve, help solve maybe the, one of the biggest environmental problems in the world? When I was working at National Geographic, I did four stories about extinction. And there have been five major extinctions in the history of the planet. Uh, I wrote a book about it. It's called Hunting Dinosaurs. But we're going through one right now that's actually caused by us. This new epoch is called the Anthropocene, which means the age of man. Some scientists say that by the end of the century, we could be losing half the species on the planet. My friends in paleontology say that when we look back at history, World War II will be a footnote in comparison to the damage that we're doing to the environment right now. The primary drivers of extinction are habitat destruction and pollution. Prior to each of these mass extinctions, we've always lost the oceans due to acidification. All five mass extinctions going back, you know, uh, back to the Devonian, the Permian. Every time, right before we, we go have a mass extinction event, we lose the oceans to acidification. And that's going on right now. This, but this time is caused by humans. And one reason may be for it is because, you, you know, we're, we're, all t- we're all breathing pretty, pretty heavily right now. We're thinking, we're, you know, there's, there's oxygen in this room. We're thinking, we, most of us probably think we're getting it from outside by the plants out there. Some of it is, about a third of it is, but two-thirds of it comes from the oceans. Two out of every three breaths you take you go to the oceans. Plankton, oceanic plankton, is the reason that, that we're here. Once there was enough oxygen in the atmosphere over billions of years, that created life forms to be able to go onto land. But now we're losing plankton at the rate of about 1% a year. Now, plankton is not just the base of the food chain. It's responsible, like I said, for two out of every three breaths we take. And we're starting to acidify the oceans about uh, those coral reefs that you saw, one reason that they're disappearing is because we're heating up the oceans and we're acidifying them and they're starting to go. We, uh, last year we lost, in the last two years, we lost about 49% of the Great Barrier Reef just in two years. People were predicting we'd, we'd start losing uh, half, the, half the, uh, the coral reefs by mid-century. That's being sped up quite a bit. Uh, probably by the time your kids have kids, um, you'll see remnants of it, but you won't see it like the pictures that we've seen. It won't see it like our generation saw it. And the other thing is that there's a billion people that rely on coral reefs for food and sustenance. Uh, A lot of the people in this room are probably aware that the raising of meat for human consumption creates more greenhouse gases than all the emissions from the entire transportation sector. Sam Simon, the creator of The Simpsons, told me, he said, a vegan driving a Hummer uses less energy than a meat eater on a bicycle. The raising of meat is responsible for much of the world's habitat destruction. Three quarters of all the agricultural land that we use in the the world is used to grow animals for feed that we're going to give them before we eat them. Very inefficient use of energy, water, food. It's an inefficient use of land and water, and it's a major source of pollution and antibiotic use. So the consumption of meat is one of the largest causes of chronic diseases. I'm doing a film right now with James Cameron. Uh, it's a, he's an executive producer. I'm the director. And we're, we're exploring that you know, the, the, the healthiest people in the world are vegan athletes. Like the world's strongest guy is a vegan. Two of the top ten boxers right now are vegan. Uh, 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 Conor McGregor, probably arguably the, the, the best UFC fighter that there ever has been, got his ass beat by, you know, Nate Diaz, a, a vegan. Uh, most accomplished ultra runner, both male and female, are vegans. Uh, Scott Jurek just ran the Appalachian Trail. He's in our next movie. He ran 2,200 miles, 46 days, two marathons a day, uh, and ran, ran the Appalachian Trail. It takes usually people five to six months to do it on a vegan diet. It's a good reason for it, too. You're, you're, uh, 
You have an inflammatory molecule kills what that happens when you eat meat, constricts your, your blood vessels, and it has the opposite effect when you have a, a vegetarian diet. It has antioxidants, so it actually enlarges your, your arteries. That's a, it's, it's the only diet in the world, a, a, veg, a, a vegan diet, that can reverse heart disease. They found out that when you do it, you can also, also uh, you think that you're born with the genetics that you have, like you're going to probably have the same fate as your mother, your father, your aunts, or uncles, but you can turn on and off genetic expressions of your genes just by adopting a plant-based diet. Uh, they're also finding that telomeres, which are like the, uh, the ends of the chromosomes, that are likened to the, the top of a shoestring, the plastic of the, that keeps a, a shoestring together. Uh, the, those telomeres actually can be healed, because as you get older, they start to fall apart, and short telomeres mean you have less of your lifetime, that you can actually expand the telomeres, you start to heal them, and extend your life by eating telomeres. These, these are all new findings uh, just in the last couple of years. So that, that, that film's on the way. But if we do want to save the planet, we have to get off of fossil fuels because that's what's acidifying the oceans and killing plankton and, and the reefs. But we also have to get off of meat consumption, re reduce it very highly. Now, we, we did a movie about this about two years ago now called Racing Extinction. Um, there's another eco-thriller that outlines a lot of the solutions. Um, let's try to let's do this again. I think we can do it. Okay, this is going. What's happening now is unprecedented in its history. Why would we want to disrupt something that took billions of years to evolve? We need to fight it on all fronts. I think it's dawning on us now that this is the big one. OPS is a group I formed. It uses covert operations to expose harm to endangered species. We're doing an order here. One bottle cam. Right there's a lens. Two buttonhole cameras. Check one, two. Oh, that's good. Just about everything endangered in the world is for sale in China. Look at this stuff. Endangered, highly endangered, highly endangered. The more illegal it is, the more you have to go to the back rooms. We're definitely not welcome here. Oh, my God. There's things going on that are probably not safe to talk about. The climate is controlled by the ocean. And we're dumping so much carbon in the oceans, it can't take it anymore. Oh, we found this guy, Mr. Lee. He's culling and processing whale sharks. Nobody ever gotten a camera in there before. We run into people with badges and uniforms. Oh, strip off there. all this stuff. Throw it over a wall. Is it a basking shot oil? Jesus. This world is absolutely insane. Wildlife trade is second only to the drug market in the world. It's that lucrative. We need a getaway driver. And I knew one of the best. I love it. To create a heist, to hijack the world's attention. I think we want to put in an order for a car today. <laughs> Excellent. We'll take one. Blow the lid off this place, right? There's been five major extinctions in the history of the planet. This may be the sixth. When you're talking about losing all of nature, it's not a spectator sport anymore. Everybody has to become active somehow. The idea is to inspire people. Imagery is very powerful. If you can reach people, you can change them. We can make this happen. We need people to understand it's worth doing. People that have been in the business that don't even bother. But better to light one candle than curse the darkness. There's so many people who sit back and say we're screwed. But you know what? That one candle, maybe someone else with a candle will find you. And I think that's where movements have started. Well, Discovery, the biggest network in the world, aired racing extinction across several of their channels on a single day. First time they'd ever done that. 36 million people saw that film in 220 countries and territories on the first day. It was one of the biggest viewings of a doc ever. But if you're trying to reach 10% of the planet, 750 million people, we came up short. We didn't have enough heat on the issue. So we needed a, to think outside the box. We needed a, a bigger, more audacious plan. I wanted to project images of endangered species on big, iconic buildings, like the United Nations headquarters and the Empire State Building, to make the biggest, brightest billboards in the world. People said I was crazy, and they gave me a lot of reasons to prove to me it was, it was crazy. 
They said I had no advertising budget. You can't do a big event like that and not advertise. They said in the summer in New York, everybody would be on vacation. They'd be in the Hamptons or in Europe. The press wouldn't turn out because it was a weekend, and the press couldn't afford to have their workers overtime on a Saturday night. And even, so even if we could do the event, it would be a non-event, and nobody would see it. Let me show you a clip from that. years, people will look back on this particular period and say to themselves, how did those people at that time just allow all these amazing creatures to vanish? But it would be very little use in me or anybody else exerting all this energy to save the wild places if people are not being educated into being better stewards than we've been. Well, we stopped New York City in its tracks. You know, Fifth Avenue looked like the Easter Parade. And every one of those people, like Nathan said, had a phone with, with a camera on it. Each one of them had a social network. And in just five days, we had 939 million media views. And we became the top trending story. That event became the top trending story on Facebook and Twitter for four days worldwide. I thought we couldn't get any bigger on that issue. And then the Pope called. Uh, Pope Francis is named after the patron saint of animals, St. Francis of Assisi. He wanted to light up the Vatican with endangered species while world leaders were in Paris at COP22, deciding historic climate, climate change agreements. He wanted to remind leaders there that their decisions on climate change was more than just saving our own species. Humans, we're just one. We're just one species. There's 10 million others that are depending on us to do the right thing. Let me show you what we did for Pope Francis. Okay, here we go. did that screen, we had uh, five days later, we had 4.4 billion media views on that event. Um, next year, we plan to light up the United Nations uh, from, United, uh, from World Environment Day to World Oceans Day, about a five-day period, and give species the, a voice on the biggest stage I can imagine with the, the entire New York City skyline in the backdrop. You know, we named ourselves Homo sapiens. It means the wise ones. We are incredible. We put humans on the moon. You know, these vast you know, net global social networks. We can do, we create amazing, amazing virtual worlds. But all life in the world, in the real world, depends on us living up to our name. Our generation, all of us here in the room, are one step away from greatness were the greatest disaster in the last 65 million years. I believe we can speed up humanity's evolution by reaching people in dramatic and conventional ways and reach a tipping point. So one day, the use of fossil fuels and the eating of animals will go the same way as eating horses, or using horses for transportation. And then we can truly live up to our name, the wise ones. Um, again, like, I had, going back to this idea that, you know, these tipping points are created, when I, you know, when I was working in, in Boulder, Colorado, I had a, 
I had a house with, uh, where I had, had my business in the back and my home in the front. I had 120 solar panels. And, you know, I, I got 140% of my energy from the roof. And, you know, we lived in Colorado, the Sunshine State. We had, you know, we had more sun than the Sunshine State. And, every, you know, I used to, I used to dread going to the, the mailbox and seeing that, you know, that electric bill. But the electric bill became an electric check because I, I generated 140% of our energy off the roof. And now I had, I had a, a, one of the two electric cars in the city and it, power, it was powered off the sun. The, the, like I said, the license plate on it said VUS, it stood for Vehicle Using Sun, the opposite of an SUV. But, uh, so, I mean, I, I, think, I think all the solutions that we're looking at, you know, we have to frame them differently, that they're, they're all, you know, they're all opportunities. You know, uh, when we look at, you know, getting people to, you know, working with Cameron, trying to get people to, um, you know, to switch, to switch over to mo more of a, a plant-based diet, we can talk about how, you know, it's the greatest ha cause of heart disease, greatest cause of environmental degradation, uh, habitat destruction, but you feel better. You know, these, you look at these super athletes, they're doing it for a reason. Um, how, how much more time do I have here? Because I, I do want to tell one little short story. Five minutes, cool. Yeah, we did, a, we did an experiment the other day. This is a good one. We took, a, so we, we took the blood of uh, three NFL players. Again, this is for that vegan movie I'm with James, James Cameron. We, and we gave them, uh, this is with Dr. Vogel, who is the uh, head of cardiology for the NFL. We took uh, blood samples from three healthy uh, Miami Dolphins uh, right, right, after, right before they made a, right after they, they ate a, a meat-based meal. And we took their blood, we centrifuged it off, we put it in a refrigerator. The second day, same time of day, we gave them a, a vegan burrito, you know, match for protein, match for fat. And we, t we spun off their blood. And the, the, the serum was, was really cl cloudy on the meat-based one. Like, it looked like Elmer's glue. And on the, the vegan burrito, it was clear. Now, this is going through your, your, your system. It's, it's creating inflammation. It's hard, it makes it harder to think. Your reaction times go down. But one of the guys that we're dealing with, our, our main star of the film, said, well, we were talking with another doctor who works, is the head of urology for the American Medical, uh, Medical Association. We said, what would it be like if we could test sexual function with a burrito? So we took three collegiate athletes, and we gave them, uh, there's, this, there's this something that you can put on a male organ, the most important organ of your body, a male's body, and it, and it, and it measures the, 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 sorry, this is a little bit embarrassing for some of you maybe, but it's really, I think this is the coolest thing in the world. It measures the erection, like the guys have normal erections in the middle of the night, so these, these kids put these things on, it measures the, the length of the erection and the hardness of it. And they have, it's, it's normal that the guys will have about five to seven erections throughout the evening. And we gave them a, a meat burrito and a vegetarian burrito the same day. You know, this thing, this device is measuring it, you know, by the second, what's going on. And you look at these graphs, and this is exciting, that's why I'm telling you this. It's, it's, it's like, the, 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 average, the average bigness was 10.5% was bigger, and the, the, the average duration of an erection was over 300%. And that's because your blood's running clear. You're not running that glue through it. You're not, you don't have inflammation. And guys, that's one of the smallest arteries in your body. You don't want that thing plugged up with animal fat. <laughs> okay. On that note... <laughs> You thought you were learning about sustainability. It's a different kind of sustainability. <laughs> it's way more important to take a home than like, you know, saving the planet through uh, climate change or whatever we're doing here. Um, well, I mean, and it's kind of like, you know, when we, we spent uh, some time with Elon Musk and, you know, when, when they, uh, he, we bought a car from him. And we changed it into like a, like a 007 car. So in the film Racing Extinction, we, had a, uh, we made it really cool. I wanted, I always, uh, the, the films I do are sort of a result of watching too many Jacques Cousteau movies and John bon, James Bond films. We took a Tesla and made it into a Bond car. It has an electroluminescent paint job. You could change the color with the flick of a button. We had a, 
uh, a 16,000 lumen projector that came out of the back, the back end with a robotic, robotic arm, and we had a, a FLIR camera, forward-looking infrared camera that could film the invisible world of carbon dioxide that came out of the trunk where you normally have the you know, an engine and an, and an internal combustion engine car, and we could print, we could show these images on the side, like the size of skyscrapers all around the country. And um, but when, but Elon told me that you know they don't, when they sell the car, they don't talk, you know, never, they never talk about you know climate change and doing the right thing. They just they they do it because they can, they make the car cooler, more fun, sexy, and and higher tech. And I think that's the, you know, the way to do it with, with all these changes, the way to, to, to work on the messaging as we're trying to go through is like, you know, the, the doomsday doesn't work so much. But there's, there's so many advantages of it. Like when we put up the solar panels, like your, your electric bill goes away. I, you know, I never had to stop for gasoline in my electric cars ever. The only time I stopped at a gas station was to fill up the tires with air. That was it. I mean, those cars are, you know, they're getting incredible. And the, and the car companies are scared because they... They don't, they don't break down as much. They can't sell you crap. You know, you can't, it's like, uh, uh, I had that Toyota RAV for eight years, never went into the shop once for anything. They damage, these things go forever. Instead of 2,000 moving parts, you know, you think about you going down the road, you have 16,000 explosions going in on your car every minute. Electric car, you have 20 moving parts. But anyway, get off my pulpit here. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. And uh, pleasure. And thank you, the tech people, for making this go. Yeah.